Welcome to the S2 Cognition Podcast. S2 is the official cognitive evaluation in sports, from youth to pro, where athletes and coaches build to win. Thanks for joining us today on the S2 Cognition Podcast. I'm your host, Harrison Hunter. In last episode, our first guest was uh, Brandon Alley, one of the co-founders of S2 Cognition. Today, we are joined by the other co-founder, Scott Wiley. I'll let the audience pick who's the brains and who's the pretty one, pun intended. Scott received his PhD in cognitive neuroscience and neuropsychology from Indiana University and completed his postdoctoral training at the University of Virginia. He has been on faculty at the University of Virginia, Vanderbilt University, and the University of Louisville. He has published 50-plus peer-reviewed papers and book chapters on brain mechanisms involved in the control, timing, and learning of motor actions. He specializes in how individuals execute split-second decisions to start, stop, and change actions as well as control, control motor impulses in the face of pressure and distraction. So, Scott, you played baseball at Point Loma University in San Diego, right? One of the prettiest places personally I've ever been. Would you say it's the best view from a baseball field in all of America? Uh, yes. And I want to thank you for um, making the introductory question about the field and uh, its aesthetics instead of my uh, play performance. So I appreciate that. Yes, it, it is uh, remarkably scenic. It sits on the cliffs of Point Loma, up um, up near the lighthouse uh, in San Diego. My freshman dorm, we could, uh, those that surfed, I was not a surfer, but my buddies that surfed would uh, leave the dorm in their wetsuits and their surfboards and walk out of the dorm, descend the cliffs, and they were in the ocean surfing. Yes, it's a, it's a remarkable view. If you are fortunate enough to jack uh, the ball over the left center field fence, it looks like it's going into the drink. Um, but, yeah, it, it's, it's remarkably scenic. If you haben't been there, it's worth uh, checking out. Carol B. Land is the name of the stadium. He uh, coached Point Loma and it, it uh, some Olympic capacities over the years is uh, in the NCAA ABCA Hall of Fame and is is has been a um, a leader in advocating for baseball and, and in the NAIA. Um, he just uh, passed away this last year, so a little shout out to uh, Coach Carol Land, who the field's named after. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. I'm. Uh... I was in Podunk, Arkansas. Shout out, Cersei. <laughs> How did you and Brandon link up to create what is now the S2 Cognition uh, product? Yeah, we uh, we linked up when we were both on faculty in the neurology department at Vanderbilt University. And we have spent most of our academic careers um, in medical centers. Uh, Brandon and I both had independent research laboratories and a small amount of our time devoted to clinical practice. Uh, Brandon and I, fortunately, being the uh, some of the, the few PhDs in an MD environment, were given space uh, out in an abandoned clinic space in the medical center. And so we had tremendous space, but adjacent space. Uh, all to ourselves, and so we built a relationship both uh, as colleagues uh, but as friends, and the story is not that uh, exciting. We had both watched the draft in 2014, and we're we're simply musing uh, during the draft about the terms used to describe these incredible athletes, Um, the intangibles, athletes who have a nose for the ball, great field vision, play faster than their foot speed, all these terms that are used to to kind of capture the instincts of an athlete. And um, we we started talking seriously um, about what the cognitive sciences and tools that we use to quantify split-second decision systems in our labs could bring to Uh, the sports world and how it could begin to quantify things that have largely been considered intangible, difficult to quantify. 
and that really was the start of it. So we, <laughs> we're not very creative, um, but this happened to be an idea that, that, that we both, having been athletes at the collegiate level, uh, got excited about and in our spare time outside of our day jobs started to put together the, the building blocks of, of what would become the S2 evaluation. That's exactly what I got into with Brandon last episode. So if you haven't heard it, check it out, uh, Brandon Alley. But we talked about the first partner and kind of test subject being LSU and getting into LSU and the coaches and testing. And it was like, wait a second, you guys are working your normal jobs, going home and then typing up these reports and, you know, finishing these reports to give a presentation. I mean, the the, the story is absolutely hilarious. The time devoted to customizing those things. Um can you give me your favorite early S2 story? Is there one or two that stick out that um, that really make you laugh when you look back on it? Oh, there's probably several. And I tell you what, you know, the the, the early stages of trying to build a, a business and, and just what goes into that, unbelievable amount of respect and appreciation for the the millions of people who set out to create their own business and start from scratch. And yes, yeah, certainly trying to maintain an, another job and do it at the same time. My, my guess is there's a lot of people in that boat who try to do something creative outside of their, their day and their night job. And so, you know, it, it was, it's nothing extraordinary or out of the ordinary that, um, that, that we set out. I think there's a lot of people that do that. We certainly can uh, relate to their, uh, <laughs> the challenges of doing that and the and the demands boy early stories um gosh i mean j yeah. we really were two dudes in a truck it it felt like i mean we <laughs> i mean i'm just going to be candid we were using equipment that we purchased off the internet that we would then test out um, we had to keep everything separate from our, our, our labs and at, at first, so there was no conflicts there. And, um, we, I went down to TJ Maxx and bought hard shelled suitcases to carry the monitors. Uh, so when we, when <laughs> we traveled around to the early teams, I mean, we showed up with suitcases with bubble wrapped monitors and these stands they weighed 110 pounds so we got double charged for weight when we traveled um it, you know some of the bubble wrap was green some of it was clear the we used mac minis um and, and just had everything wrapped in all these suitcases i think probably the the, the funniest and earliest uh experiences sometimes we'd look at each other as we're you know walking through carrying dragon suitcases and say what are we doing uh <laughs> we never knew it was going to be like this so i i think that was that's probably one of the the earliest uh stories of, of j just the what you go through to to then turn something in uh to to to, to something that's imp impactful so compared to other cognitive science evaluations in sports, what is different in our process of how we evaluate these cognitive process and how we recommend the training of said processes, right? Yeah, you know, that's, that's a great question. Uh, you know, how do we diagnose and how do we measure cognition is your first part of your question. And then what is our kind of framework and approach to training. And let me start with the evaluation side of things. So, so Br Brandon and I have the, uh, kind of a unique uh, training in that we're both cognitive neuroscientists in the lab, but we're clinical neuropsychologists in the clinic. And so what we use to measure cognition and decision and, and thinking skills and memory skills in the clinic uh, involve a to completely different set of tools and tasks. And, you know, some of those tasks would measure, quantify things like IQ, your intelligence, your, your generalized memory skill, how many words you can remember if we read a list to you a few times, and then we came back 20 minutes later to see how many you could recall. 
Um, if we read you a string of numbers, how many can you remember over a short period of ten, uh, time and attend to? Can you say them backwards, looking at how flexible your thinking is? And so we use a completely different set of tools. And I think most of the approaches historically in sports have started there, either looking at IQ in football. The Wonder Lick is a paper and pencil bubble sheet test that has uh, moderate correlations with intelligence, um, IQ. And there have been other approaches, sometimes using the, the concussion tests or uh, IQ-based tests that really are, were intended to capture kind of everyday thinking skills and more abstract reasoning abilities. Now, certainly athletes have to use those when they're studying complicated schemes and playbooks and and it's helpful to be, you know to be able to 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 cognitively and, and intellectually understand the more complicated aspects of of performance and play and strategy. But when it all said and done, the athletes on the field are using very different brain systems. They're making these sub-second, split-second decisions. The systems involved in processing information that is ha changing dynamically and changing rapidly we would use a, a completely different set of tools in the cognitive sciences to, to measure and quantify those skills. So that is the big difference. We assembled the best tools. When I say best, it's, it's not what we think is best. It's, it's the best from the field of cognitive psychology and cognitive neuroscience, the tools that have withstood the test of time and have been researched for decades and really help quantify uh, specific cognitive systems, the same systems these athletes are using when they're actually playing. So not IQ, not everyday thinking skills, it's the rapid, fast processing of what you see, linking what you see to what you do, and controlling your actions and redirecting and controlling impulses. So our tasks are designed to capture the systems athletes use when they play. So that's the big difference. And, and I think the other thing that we do very carefully is, is we treat our assessment like we would a study in the lab. We use the best software. We, we, we use the best technology. We use specialized response devices to ensure that every millisecond of a task and a trial and a response is recorded with the utmost level of precision. You, you just can't use everyday computers and even uh, gaming computers or keyboards are notoriously riddled with a lot of variability uh, in their timing. Monitors vary. You can't use iPads to really capture the level of precision that's required um, to, to quantify these quick decisions athletes are, are using. Milliseconds matter on the field. So that's the assessment side. I'm, I'm you know, I've, now on the training side, um, I'm going to run long here unless it. you want to jump in. Yeah, it. yeah. No, I love it. No, so that's, a, that's the, the assessment is, is precision. It's measuring what these athletes' brains do. And so then you get on the, the training side. And one of the things we recognized when we first got into this was everybody had jumped on the brain training bandwagon. And, um, you know, we'd come out of the decade of the brain, brain training games online were hot, and um, <clears throat> you had whack-a-mole boards, or you got a touch boards and screens, you got iPad apps and iPhone apps that um, provided promise to, if you worked on them a few tens of minutes a day, you'd, uh, you'd become a better hitter or a better soccer player. And, and um, you know, it, it's, it's, um, man, I, I don't blame teams for trying that, but I think they discovered very quickly that there's, there's, there's some hurdles, big hurdles. It's hard to get transfer outside of the sports context from an iPad app or a game on a, on a touchscreen board to transfer to the field. It's really difficult to do that, and we've known that. Um, it's a lot easier, and there's a lot of science showing that you can achieve what we call near transfer, and so if there's overlap between the stimulus demands and stimulus processing demands of a, of a drill or a training experience or the response characteristics are similar. So instead of putting the bat down and picking up an iPad, you keep the bat in the hand and you incorporate the action into the cognitive training, the decision-making training. 
ultimately, you need to link what you see to what you rapidly decide to what you do. And the more the context can have all three of those elements working together, the more likely you are to, to really move the needle, to develop the kinds of, of brains connections and associations that are cr critical and underlie uh, performance. And so our philosophy on training is pretty simple. Let's first understand what your brain does well and what you might struggle with, and then let's target and design and using cognitive principles underlying those systems uh, to develop smarter drills and activities on the field, in the sport, in the context, keeping the action involved as well. And uh, so that, in a kind of a broad strokes, is, is our approach. So essentially, we are trying to efficiently train, right? Not everyone needs the same drills. Not everyone needs to do the same. Now, why that's good to broad stroke, right? That's how it efficiently we can target these areas because everyone's hardwired differently. Yeah, that's exactly right. I, you know, there, there are probably some cognitive skills and decision skills that are, are pretty generic and important to athletes at all levels, but you can always make them harder or easier, uh, more challenging. But you're right, as, as you move up the ladder, you, you need to understand how you're wired. And um, there are just going to be things that, that your genetics and that your brain wiring um, places limits on your capacity. And there's going to be some things that you can work around, you can adapt. And there's going to be some skills that you um, uh, have developed that are exceptional and you've got to work you got to fine-tune those and you've got to figure out ways to mitigate your weaker areas from showing up on the field and when possible some brain systems are more malleable than others um, some are tough to move some are easier to move and those that are easier to move and train in context uh, absolutely the more customized individualized you can be you can have Athletes, two athletes that make the same kind of mistakes, but for very different reasons. And if you train them the same, one might get better, one might not. Or maybe your training doesn't address either of their underlying reasons for their, their mental mistakes or their decision difficulties. So in, in the first episode, we got really into the beginning of football and the first steps we took in football. I want to pivot a little bit to walk through baseball with you. So my next couple questions will be centered around that. How, how did baseball find this product? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I, I think we had a, a few connections to a, an, an MLB team or two that opened up very early on. We also had a connection or uh, were introduced to one of the assistant hitting coaches at Lipscomb University. We're based here in Nashville. Lipscomb is one of the universities here, uh, their Division I program. And uh, that assistant coach was Paul Phillips, who actually now works for S2. Uh, but Paul had played uh, 15 years of uh, professional baseball, parts of seven seasons in the big leagues. He was a catcher. He's coached collegiately. He's coached at the professional level, both as a, as a hitting uh, coach and as a catching coordinator. Uh, I think you're going to have him on uh, here pretty soon. Uh, but but just an incredibly talented, very cerebral, uh, thinking ball player, thinking coach, and and he, we got to meet him pretty early on when we had a few uh, initial engagements with some pro teams that were starting to ask questions about how their athletes' brains work. And Paul, at the collegiate level, was instrumental. We spent a lot of time with him. We tested his players. Uh, he'll tell you some great stories about the initial interactions, but I, I think a few teams and um, uh, an initial college really started to build our database, build our confidence that we're measuring the right things. And from there, it, it just kind of expanded. We had three or four uh, MLB teams establish a, an initial consortium in MLB, and, and we said, hey, we're going to learn our way forward. We're going to do this the right way. Collect, we tested all their organizational players. We started uh, measuring athletes in anticipation of the draft and uh, working with player development staffs a little bit. And, and so really um, building the database so then we could do some analytics. And it just kind of snowballed from there. 
Uh, every year we kept adding more teams and the word started to spread and then we built a, a consortium of one team from every every division and then it jumped to two teams per division and that's kind of where we stand here. The two are um, um, keeping it so that we, the two teams per division are keeping it so that uh, the rest of the division can't get access. So nice place. Let me pivot be. real quickly. You you brought up a really a really uh, Paul Phillips is, does a great job from a coaching perspective and you get firsthand see this because he's coaching one of your sons one of your little dudes right Yes he is Yep So you get to see that from a hands on experience what a what what a dude at your son's level gets to learn right We wish we learned this at his age right when I, we were playing It's so funny because uh, I I mean I played a little college ball I don't brag about it That's all I'm going to say about it. I played at a beautiful baseball park. Did we cover that? Uh, <laughs> but yes, my 11-year-old, they have an 11U team, and uh, Paul is one of the coaches. And Daniel Shu, who's uh, who's another, he played college ball at a, at a high level and, and just as a as a salt of the earth human being as well as a he knows the game and these guys are are teaching the 11 year olds things i didn't learn until i was in college and in fact there's a few things i've heard them say that i went huh that's that makes sense now and uh yeah, it's yeah. new to me too and my 11 year olds uh, 11 year olds are uh, are learning that so they're they're getting exposed to uh, rundowns and pickoff moves. I mean, just the fundamentals of baseball that most peop- most kids don't acquire until they're a little bit older. But yeah, it's 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 a real good experience, and um, yeah, it's fun. Yeah, I'm gonna pivot back to I'm gonna pivot back to us too. I just wanted to take a little trip because I I've heard stories. I've seen them in action myself. How is baseball now from the beginning to to current? using our evaluation and training processes. Yeah, you know, I think the initial interest out of the gates was once they tested their organizational players and started to see that that there was a pattern of players at the highest level, achieving at the highest level, their brains are wired differently. They, they, They just... At the highest level, you have to be physically and technically talented and gifted, and everyone's big, fast, and strong, and uh, has a great, you know, great swing. It's the it's those who can handle the the complexity of the game at the highest level. Those those pitchers do not make it easy. It, it's unbelievable the velocity, the pinpoint precision, and mixing pitches and sequences. Uh, it is it is arguably one of the most demanding um, feats a human being can in, in, can accomplish in sports. These hitters' brains have to process so much information and organize and orchestrate a precision reaction in such a, a short period of time. It, it is not surprising to us, but it was it was exciting to see that to play at the highest level, your brain has to be able to, to do things at a pretty superhuman level. And um, that said, it doesn't have to do everything well that we measure about uh, eight different processes, the hitters from visual stuff to some to the motor end of things. And you could have different patterns, but you better
So you're alluding to some serious and significant findings and models. I, I would love for you to talk about some of the most significant ones that you've found so far and, and what you can uh, hypothesize moving forward that you will continue to see. man. Yeah, that's crazy. Wow. <laughs> Holy cow.
So from a br- yeah, from a brain's perspective, can you explain how these world-class professional athletes, by and large, separate themselves from your everyday average Joe? Uh, not to be rude, but you and me. So my next question was right in in line with what you just said. So you specialize in the motor control functions of the brain, like what we just talked about. So explain to the to the listener what that means in everyday life when when they have to make these split second decisions. What does that look like from an executive function standpoint? <laughs> yes. Yes.
It's fascinating to me. So how does our product then fit into youth sports and specifically baseball, right? We've talked about from a professional level, even a collegiate level, how it's been utilized from your perspective, especially as a dad, you got sons, I know you put them through drills. Well, how can this be adapted in the youth market? Absolutely. You ready to move into the three random funny questions portion of our podcast? That means we're coming. You ready? Okay. No recency bias, but your favorite state in America is? And I only say that because we were just in Park City, Utah, and I know how beautiful that place was. It's 96 degrees today. 96. <laughs> oh. Mm. 
Mm, you can't go wrong. Okay, you get one superpower for the rest of your life. What is it and why? Shout out Maverick. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's good. No, that's, we're keeping it. Yeah, that's a clutch answer. It's like a guy with a truck. He you're always you're always going to ask him to help you move. And the last question, would you rather go back in time to meet your ancestors or go into the future to meet your great-great-grandchildren? That's a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you so much, Scott, for joining us. We appreciate your time today to tell the story of S2 Cognition in its infancy and now where we are, especially in baseball. Coming up next, we're going to have Paul Phillips, the director of everything baseball and softball here for S2 Cognition. But for now, we're going to take a quick break. Thanks again, Scott. S2 Cognition's Director of Baseball and Softball, Paul Phillips. Paul was drafted by the Kansas City Royals after playing for the University of Alabama. He logged 15 years of pro ball with six major league organizations. Seven of those seasons he spent in the bigs with the Royals, White Sox, and Rockies. Paul then coached college baseball for a few years before coaching professional baseball. After a couple of seasons as a AAA hitting coach and catching coordinator, he joined our team at S2 Cognition as our baseball softball guy. So, Paul, how did you hear about S2 Cognition originally? Uh, when I was at Lipscomb, uh, Brad Kuhn was uh, one of the coaches there with me, uh, and we were talking about you know brain stuff, and I was reading a book called The Sports Gene, and he asked me if I really got into all that, and I thought it was pretty interesting. And, uh, and so he's like, well, you need to meet this guy named Brandon Alley. And uh, he's like, he's a, he's a brain guy over at Vanderbilt. And so I literally, I, I got connected with Brandon, and Brandon and Scott came over to the school, and they tested our team. And um, I, I just thought it was so fascinating. And I thought I was getting punked all at the same time because they were telling me, you know, information about our players that, I'm like, they don't even know these dudes' names. I'm like, how in the world are they supposed to know how they play baseball? Right. And so whenever I uh, got the results back from them testing, you know, we sat down for, gosh, hours just going over the results. And that was my first interaction with them. So what was your level of skepticism? One of my favorite things about you is someone will say something. And if you're if it's something feels off just a little, you're like, wait a second, I need to make sure that this information is correct. So I, I want to talk to you about your level of skepticism at first when you thought they were, hey, are they punking me with this information? Yeah. How do they know this stuff? Yeah, no doubt, man. It was high. I mean, I just came from professional baseball, right? <laughs> I had played um, 15 seasons. And I, I, for me as a player, I, I think that I've been around the best of the best right? With the best coaches, the best tech, the best information. And now I'm sitting here in my office at Lipscomb University with 
two cognitive neuroscientists, and they're telling me how these kids play, and they've never seen them log an at bat at all, right? And they're telling me, hey, this kid's gonna, you know, he's gonna be pretty good, right? And they asked me about him one, they asked me about one specific player. And they're like, tell us about this guy. And I'm like, no, 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 you tell me about this guy. You're supposed to be wowing me, not me telling you. And so they're like, oh, okay, well, you know, here you go. This is what we see. And basically, you know, the, the kid, we were going to, he was a freshman, and we were going to bat him ninth just to get his feet wet because we didn't normally start freshman players. Um, but this kid was legit, and we thought he had an opportunity to play and, and be a starter as a freshman. And so we were going to bat him ninth, get his feet wet, until we saw his scores and got confirmation from them. We ended up bumping him up to the, to the leadoff spot because that's what we actually envisioned him being was our leadoff guy. And he goes on to be a freshman All-American, you know, because based on, you know, what he had to offer and what he brought to the table. And so, you know, that was, that was pretty interesting to me. Just in the very beginning, I was just like, no, 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 you tell me what you know. Like, I already see what they do on the field. You tell me what, what you see based on your results. So there was, there was a lot of skepticism there. And, you know, and I try to poke holes in a lot of stuff, you know, because at the end of the day, you know, we, we want to find something that's true and legit, right? And I want to make sure that whatever it is that, that we're selling to the players and, and we won't buy in, we, we got to have total buy-in too, you know, but, you know, after I sat down and visited with those guys, it was, it was, um, pretty clear and, and pretty evident that they had something that was different and special. So do you remember that first moment where you said, holy crap, this product is insanely helpful for me? Oh, absolutely. I'll never forget because we were even, you know, I had, I had a piece of paper that had every one of my players scores in every category. I had that on a piece of paper and I had it on the field with me. And so we're running through a defensive set and coaches hitting the ball and and he's asking me, he's like, why can't this guy get this, right? And I look down at my piece of paper and I'm like, oh wait, he struggles at that, huh? Hold on, let me let me go talk to him for a second. And so I had to go give him the rules, right? He couldn't figure it out on his own. He couldn't. He didn't have instinctive learning very well, right? And so I had to go give him the rules. Hey, if the ball is bunted like this, throw it here. If it's bunted like that throw it here if it's done, if it's this, that, whatever. Had to give him the rules, and then he didn't make mistakes after that. And coach was like, what'd you tell him? I'm like, well, I just gave him the information based on how he learns and how he processes information. I just gave him the rules of the game. He goes, well, I was just expecting him to figure it out watching the guy beside him. I said, well, that's not how he processes information, so mm. that's not how we have to coach him. And, and that was a, that was a, like a, a holy cow, aha moment. You know, I'm like, well... All right, maybe this information is, uh, it's, it really is on point, like they said, too. So how quickly after you, you initially got the information was that moment? Probably, it was probably, I mean, as soon as I started having conversations with them, it started happening immediately. You know, but then when I started seeing it in front of me happening on the field and me actually explaining it to the kids because I understood it, then that was something I was just like, how did I ever play or do anything without this information? You know, as a coach, it's unbelievable yeah. how it, it eliminates the guesswork on what a player needs. So how does our data help major league teams as well as college baseball teams? You can go a million different directions with that, but you personally, how have you seen it work in both major league baseball and college baseball? Well, you know, the best coaches are, are in college baseball the best recruiters. Right. And so if you recruit the best players, you typically don't have to develop too much because they're already better than everybody else. Right. And so it helps your winning percentage tremendously. Right. And same thing in pro ball. If you pick the best players, it's a lot easier for your player development staff to fine tune them instead of build them up. Right. And so first on the front side, it's, it's picking the right players. So using the data to pick the right players is tremendous with your with building up your organization. And on the player development side, you know, everybody has something going on. And so it's whether you have to fine tune or you really got to get in there and grind on it. Uh, it, it. It helps you, first and foremost, save time on figuring out what's wrong with them. Right. And, and when I say what's wrong with them, it's just what is what is posing their roadblock to to them having tremendous success at this point. 
right? And so, you know, you could have swing and miss going on. You could have chase going on. You could have low contact going on. But all of these systems that we can identify, you can see which system is responsible for what action on the field. And by doing that, you're not guessing now what you need to work on because you have the data right in front of you. And then you can spend that time looking at that system, training those systems um, based on the drill work that we have laid out for it, and then you just you, you minimize the amount of time that a player could possibly be in a slump as well. So that's the efficiency that's the biggest, of the player. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's the whole point. So, I mean, that player is your investment. That's right. That's right. Can you tell the story of how you utilize S2 with Austin Nola uh, and your first experience in the minor leagues with him? Yeah, so, you know, when, when Nola was with the Marlins, um, we used this product, and it was pretty interesting because, you know, I saw where his brain was in this development, saw um, the abilities that he had, and it helped me with him, you know, as being his hitting coach at the current moment uh, when we first started using it. It helped me understand that, you know, he needed to work with some of the stuff on catching up to a fastball. And so we started working on some of those things and started getting better at those, started doing better drill work to really target that. And things started really started unlocking for him and he started clicking a whole lot better with that. And then once we had conversations about him converting from a shortstop to a catcher, I noticed that his report was matched perfectly to be able to do that. And so that's when, you know, I started speaking with Mark Del Piano and, and the front office about you know, the conversion of Austin Nola from a shortstop to a, a catcher. And so we started doing that and we started taking what he brought to the table and putting it in his drill packaging for catching. And, you know, the rest is history from there. You know, I mean, we really started just blowing up the, the drill packaging based on what he could do. And, you know, and now he's a big league catcher. As a former college coach and recruiter, how can youth organizations and baseball players take advantage of our evaluation and what we deliver for them? Well, the cool part about, you know, on the college side, looking at these players, no college recruiter is going to go and watch a game and ask what everybody's S2 scores are on the front side, right? If you play good, they're going to want to know what your S2 scores are on the back side. Right, so it's very crucial for a player on the front side to take the evaluation to see what he needs to work on so he catches the eye of the recruiter on the field. Right, and so it comes a full circle. The player needs to have it on the front side for player development so that they can catch the eye of the, of the recruiter while he's out there watching the game. Because the better you do in your practice and development, the better you're going to perform on the field. Now you're catching the eye of the recruiter or the scout then at that point he's going to know what kind of capacity do you have? Do you have the ability to play at the highest level with what your brain brings to the table? And then at that point it comes full circle, right? You know what you need to work on in the beginning. You start targeting that. You start building it up and developing it and grow it. And now you're using it on the field. You're performing better. You get the eye of the recruiter. And now all of these systems are benefiting from you knowing that in the front side and working on that in the player development side. Are the cognitive demands different for baseball and softball players? So they are the very they're they're very same as far as what they're needed to do on the field, right? So we measure the same systems in the brain in baseball as we do in softball because it's very very similar, right? And so the we don't have to search for things, right? Because we know where the ball is coming from out of the pitcher's hand, right? So we don't have to we don't have to search for our receiver like a like a quarterback does, even though he has a check down list. Or even even maybe like he gets turned around and now he has to to find and, and track multiple objects. We don't have to track multiple objects, right? As a hitter, there's only one ball coming towards us. And so with that being said, the demands for a cognitive um, system in baseball and softball are very similar, similar um, but they are they are a lot different than they are in football. So the, between baseball and softball, they're 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 pretty much set the same. That's right because you're in the box, you're facing a. a you know, a multitude of pitches that you have to select timing from and rhythmically time up. All of those things are pretty much the same because when you're in the box, you're trying to hit the ball. Absolutely. You know, the cool part is, is, is you know, when you, when you talk about the rhythmic timing, I mean, there's, there's a difference between being on time for a pitch with your body versus being on time at contact with the barrel, 
right? And those are two separate timing systems that we can identify, you know, if one might be lower than the other, we can identify and target which way to train. So, I mean, it, it's, it can get pretty in depth with how you can really address a player and help them. So you mean when Josh Donaldson hits with that leg kick and Troy Tulo used to hit with that leg kick? You mean everybody can't hit like that? Nope. <laughs> nope. So that's if, and if you watch Donaldson, his leg kick changes heights based on based on strikes, right? And so I mean because he knows he has to be ready for certain things versus him sitting on certain things. It's just everybody can't hit with a big leg kick. That's unbelievable. So how are the cognitive demands different for hitters compared to pitchers? Yep, so hitters react to the environment, pitchers control the environment, right? And so pitchers have different cognitive demands that they have to have, right? And so, you know, you're talking about a pitcher can, they can process this information in two, three seconds. Hitters are looking at, you know, sub 400 milliseconds, right? And so their decisions are more about reacting instead of controlling the environment. And so that that puts a, a much higher demand on the hitter versus the pitcher, even though, each each position has very important cognitive skills that they that are necessary for them to be successful, uh, but but the hitter has a lot more strain on theirs than the pitchers do. Every fall instruct and spring training that we go out for, w when you're working with our major league organizations and their minor league major league staffs, what are you trying and hoping to accomplish with them when we go out there? Well, some of the first things is just making sure that the drill they're actually doing is targeting the brain system that they're actually trying to target, right? And so, you know, there are some, some drills that are very, very good for mechanics that work zero decision making. And there are some drills that are strictly about working decisions, but they're, they're making it a little more complex with two to three to four systems being involved at the same time instead of really isolating the drill to target the one that they're actually trying to train. And so it's just to make sure, like, I mean, there's so many creative coaches in professional and college baseball. And so just because a drill is harder doesn't mean it's working what they want it to work. And so my job is just to try to help keep them in the, you know, in the idea, in the same mindset of what they're actually trying to do with the brain system they're really wanting to work. Um, you know, but they have some really creative stuff. We just have to make sure that they're they're not overwhelming the player um, with two to three to four systems at one time when they're really just trying to focus on one. So, you know, it's it's really a good time for me because I get to visit with these coaches and these creative minds uh, in creating drill work for these guys. Um, so that's the that's that's the fun part that I get to do whenever I visit with these teams. What's one of the most creative drills you've seen someone come up with? Well, you know, just in the beginning working, you know, when we started talking about timing and working a four plate drill, you know, when you're trying to teach someone to catch up to a fastball and you set those four plates up, you know, a lot of people don't understand the dynamics between the distance and the, the miles per hour. I mean, like every 18 inches is around five miles an hour, right? And so when you're getting closer to the pitcher source, it's about five miles an hour every 18 inches. And so when you're moving from the back plate all over the front plate, you're making a 15 mile an hour difference. I mean... You think about going from plate four, which is the one closest to the pitching source, all the way back to plate one, which is furthest away from the pitching source, that's a nasty changeup. I mean, that's a 15 mile an hour difference. If you're going from that first plate, hitting a pitch, and then backing up all the way to that back plate, that's 15 mile an hour difference. That's a nasty changeup, right? And so when you start doing things like that and you start randomly moving around, training your timing system of knowing when do I pull the trigger to swing the bat, that's a pretty creative drill. You know, and a lot of times people do those drills, but they really aren't sure what they're doing. They're really not sure what they're accomplishing and what they're, tr they know they're trying to make it different and difficult. Hey, we're gonna do a three plate drill, four plate drill to mix up timing, right? But it, there's a there's a progressive way to, to do that drill so that it sticks and actually transfers into performance on the field, right? And so, I mean, that's one of my favorite drills to do because, I mean, if you think about it, in baseball, hitting is timing. In pitching, it's the disruption of timing, right? And so if a hitter can be more on time, then they're going to have a little bit more chances of success in doing that. And so that's why I love doing that drill. I think it's one of the most creative things to do, um, especially when someone's struggling with making contact. 
Do you have a, you know, speaking of drills, do you have a story with Stanton and some drills that you used to do? Well, I tell you, he had, he had an interesting drill that was more about trajectory. And it was pretty cool because, you know, we, we get on the machine and, uh, you know, when you shoot leather balls through the pitching machine, he had this drill where he did was a nasty slider at the bottom of the strike zone. And there would be balls. So he would probably have it about just below the strike zone. But every now and again, one of those balls, because maybe the, the leather was a little looser from going through the machine or whatever, it would pop up and he would smack it. He would take all the ones that were just below the zone and one would pop up and he would smash it. And he wouldn't swing at the other ones. And I'm like, that's absolutely fascinating. One day when I first started doing it with him, I fixed it, and he goes, oh, no, 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 keep it down there. Every now and again, one will pop up, and I'll hit it. And I'm like, <laughs> can't wait to see this. Sure enough, dude, <laughs> killed it, killed it. It was amazing. So it's kind of like you're talking about he, he was practicing taking and swinging in the same drill. Yeah. How often do, do organizations <laughs> or colleges practice taking? Okay, well, I played 15 years of pro ball. I played, you know, three years of college ball. Never one time did I practice taking. Not once, right? Coached three years at Lipscomb University. Didn't practice taking there until I met Scott and Brandon. Okay, then we started tapping into that. First time I go, then I go to the Marlins to be the AAA hitting coach, working with Stanton in big league spring training. Literally first time I ever saw a big leaguer work on taking. And so, like, it's just people, people don't teach you how to take they teach you how to swing and tell you what they want you to take, right? You can't will yourself to take. You have to practice taking. And what Stanton was doing was practicing not swinging at that low slider, yet he was still smacking the ones that were strikes. He took the ones that were down. That's also working on impulse control, right? And so that's pretty fascinating that he was working on two things at the same time with impulse and trajectory. First, he had to recognize that there was a strike. But secondly, he was only swinging at the strikes and didn't swing at any pitch that wasn't. I mean, that's that's fascinating. That's that's truly cognitive training. It's pretty amazing. Uh, is, is it true that you will take more pitches in your career than you will see or and swing at? Yes, absolutely. Well, if if you're good. If you're good. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there are a lot that's, of people. There are a lot of people out there that swing early and often. You know, and so, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're good. You know, it's funny because there are certain players, you know, that uh, in the past I can remember reading scouting reports, hey, this guy's a really good first ball hitter. And I'm like, okay, so let's make sure we don't throw him a good pitch on the first pitch. Mm -hmm. You know, and so, you know, with my catching background, it's, I don't want people just smashing homers on first pitch because we try to get ahead, right? Especially when people that you know are very good at it. And some people aren't good at it. And, you know, well, clearly you understand now our program can help you understand who probably is going to be good at it and who's not. So That's right. It's just fascinating to me that, and myself included now, I, I certainly didn't play to the level that you were able to achieve, but I don't remember uh, maybe one or two drills that worked on not swinging. But, yeah, it was kind of like, yeah, we're, we're it, you're always going to swing. That's the goal of hitting. Right. But we're just going to tell you to take. And now seeing it on the flip side and also seeing some statistics that say, yeah, over the course of your lifetime and at bats, you, you will probably see more pitches and not swing at them than you will swing at pitches. It's crazy to, to hear the difference in training. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, the, just the interesting thing with, with, you know, it's always go, go, go. And then they ask you, why would you swing at that? I mean, I think the true answer is because I thought I could hit it, right? Or else you wouldn't have swung at it. Right. And so, but at the end of the day, the answer most people say is, I don't know. Right. And that's a legit answer. That's a true answer because they don't know. Right. Without our evaluation, they truly don't know. And then once you take the evaluation, you see the system is low. Oh, okay. Well, clearly that's why I'm doing it. Right. And then you target that system with drill work and you work on it. And you can't, like I said, you can't will yourself to stop. you got to practice it. And then once That's you start right. practicing it, you get better at it. That's just the way it works. So what are you most excited about when looking at the future of baseball and softball divisions of S2 Cognition? 
oh man, higher quality of performance. Like uh, when I see players, you know, think about when college programs and pro teams, they're picking better players. The competition level is just going to get that much higher and that much better, right? I mean, and everybody wants to see high quality performance. Nobody wants to see the number one team play the number 30 team and thump them. Nobody wants to see that. That's right. Everybody wants to see a close game, maybe even a maybe even a, a good, you know, high scoring game sometimes, you know, and, and and so but at the end of the day, you know, people like action. People like excitement. People and, and to me that's what this is gonna do. It's just gonna make the quality of the player better. Whether whether that starts at, at the player development level, which it should in, in youth organizations from them taking the evaluation and seeing what they need to work on to get better at these things, to then at that point getting selected by these Power Five or even these these um, college programs, even if it's a junior college program, you know it doesn't matter. There's still legitimate programs out there that that their performance on the field is is fun to watch, right? And then taking it into the professional level, you know that's the whole that's the whole point in player development is to make the product better. And so that's what I love about this is that it cuts down the, the guesswork and it helps us understand what it is we need to work on and target with this player so that we can make the product better. As a father and a former coach, you know, I know you're a little biased with answering this question, but why would you encourage your sons to take this evaluation? Well, because I want to make sure that I teach them right. You know, I want to make sure that, you know, I also understand what I brought to the table because I've taken the evaluation. You know, I've put my older son through the evaluation, and I see that I've clearly given him some of the problems that I had. And so with that, I need to make sure that I target that early so he doesn't have that same deficiency later on in his life like I had. And so I want to make sure that I'm doing the things for him based on his results at his age because his age, I mean, you know, he's 11. We're able to move the needle so much more in an 11-year-old than we are a 35-year-old. And so with that being said, I want to make sure he reaps all the benefits of knowing this information on the front end. That's awesome. So we uh, end each interview with three random funny questions. Randomly selected. Are you ready to rock? Ready. Okay. Would you rather relive your best sports moment exactly how it happened or relive your worst sports moment and have a chance to correct it? Uh, the best one. Red the best one. The best. Can, yeah, okay. What's the best one? Yeah. So my best one was when I was um, with Colorado uh, in St. Louis. So I was four for five with a homer, three RBIs. Mm. Yeah. I'd take that all day. Do that all day. Take, yeah. Do it all over. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, is it because I said the chance to uh, improve or chance to change your best one? I don't know that I would be able to change it. It was funny because my post interview, I got out on my last at bat and I popped up to the catcher. And the first question I got asked was, you couldn't go five for five? I was like, I was just lucky to go four for five. <laughs> I don't think okay, that I could so, change that. Yeah, no, no question. Uh, best TV show you've ever watched is? Mm, I don't really do TV shows that much. So... I will have to go if I'm gonna switch it from a TV show to a TV to a movie. Okay. Top Gun's my favorite movie. Did you see the second one? I haven't yet, but I'm going. Oh man, yes, you, dude, it is awesome. I'm not gonna spoil it for you, but the the graphics are insane. How they're able to shoot some of that footage. Yeah. Oof. All right, you're gonna get me all get me all hot and bothered. All right, last one. Being a huge Alabama fan and a proud alumni, would you rather the football team win the next title? Or the baseball team? Both. Both? Both. Either or. Either. Oh, man. You know, look, I love I love Alabama football with all my heart. I love Alabama baseball. Um, I guess if I had to, if I really had to pick it, gosh, I'd love to see baseball win a championship. Um, Alabama's had, Alabama football's had a lot here lately. I would love to see That's some right. baseball, baseball. Uh, love spread across the College World Series. That'd be phenomenal. That makes sense. That is Paul Phillips, S2 Cognitions, Director of Baseball and Softball. Paul, man, thanks for your time today. We appreciate it. And uh, hopefully we'll have you on again soon. Awesome. Thanks, Harrison.